So here's, uh, here's what we're going to do. Let me say a couple of things uh, to start out with. First, thanks to the Student Association for bringing me up here. Um, Jesse Ginsberg uh, has been an organizer of this for the last couple of years. He's been threatening I would have to come to New Paltz. And I just, yeah, 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 whatever, you know, yeah, whatever you say, Jesse. Um, so props to Jesse and the Student Association for bringing me here. It's uh, an honor because, one, I want to talk to you about organizing, and two, I want to hear the part that's most interesting to me when we get to the questions you might have. So a couple of things just by introduction. There are a couple of cameras here, one here and one in the back. This is Joey Carey and Nick Taylor, and they have been doing a documentary for the last, I don't know, it seems like forever, but it's about four years. Um, maybe they'll finish someday, maybe they won't. Any of you, though, who are in a witness protection program and don't want to be filmed, I just need to always tell you in the beginning, they're filming. My new friend Sarah is also filming. She's mainly not filming you, but um, so you know it's here. Uh, and then when they go Broadway, we'll let the Student Association know. I'm going to talk to you about two or three things here this evening. First, I'm going to give you some background similar to the introduction on what ACORN was and is and how it got there. And then we're going to talk about what community and labor organizing is around the world now and some of the challenges and some of uh, what confronts all of us. Obviously, whatever I might have said yesterday is even worse today. If you have read any of the papers, uh, we're looking at a long couple of years. So uh, you may be in the safest place you can be right now, which is actually in a closeted student environment for the next year or two, because God knows what's going to happen to the rest of us. So. How I spend my time is I'm now Chief Organizer of ACORN International. It's based on the ACORN model that we built uh, starting in 1970 in Arkansas. What we have globally is 110,000 members. What we do is we build membership-based organizations of lower income people. And by membership-based, these organizations are largely supported by membership dues. It's actually poor people. When we're working in Peru or India or whatever, we're working in Dharavi in the middle of Mumbai, or we're working in San Juan Laragancho in Lima, or we're working in La Matanza outside of Buenos Aires, or we're working in the NESA outside of Mexico City. These are some of the largest mega slums in the world. We also have started organizing in in many cases in the United States this is true, but it's also increasingly true around the world that where people live and where people work can't be distinguished among lower income people. So we also organize not only community organizations, but also labor associations and labor unions in some places. In Bangalore, for example, we now have 15,000 members uh, in that town. Bangalore is how many people know it in the West. It's seen as a high-tech area for India, but the truth is we organize hawkers, street vendors, sidewalk sellers, domestic workers, rickshaw pullers, uh, people who are working for barely subsistence wages who need a union. We also have 2,000 members in a summer union in Delhi and Mumbai. Here's sort of where the map is for Acorn International. You know, before I was going to crick my neck here, I didn't realize I could look right here and see the whole thing. This is a wonderful thing. This is like, this is nice tech stuff. Go, girl. I appreciate it. You know, I need training in it. Um, so where Acorn International has the most of is in Canada. Toronto, New Brunswick, Hamilton, Ottawa, New Westminster and Vancouver, and starting soon in Montreal. We have some members there, and that organization is just beginning. In Latin America, we work in Honduras, San Pedro Sula, Tegucigalpa, as I said, Dominican Republic, Mexico City, Tijuana, Quito, uh, Ecuador. We also work in Nairobi, Kenya, 
We have a group in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, and more recently, we started working in Europe, largely, uh, it's been interesting, more about housing than anything else. Bristol, Edinburgh, Reading, Birmingham, London, Paris, Grenoble, Rome, Prague. It's a big world, it turns out. Um, the most refreshing thing about working in Europe is some people speak English, so I actually know what we're doing some of the time. 19 countries, campaigns tend to be about those things that, at least internationally, pull everybody together. People know what remittances are? Somebody's bound to know it. Money transfers, if anybody has family that comes from another part of the world, has immigrated here, part of what moves this economy is billions of dollars that's ripped off by banks, Western Union, MoneyGram, other kinds of money transfer organizations that we've been trying to win a cap on that and that's what we call remittance justice, digital divide, you know what that is. Turns out tenants and landlords are problems all over the world. We'll talk more about that. We do it face to face and that's how we organize, that's the heart of what our model is, organizing committee, committees, home visits, door knocking, personal contact. See some of our organizers uh, signing up people in India and in Mexico right there. The top picture is a shelter we do for informal workers in Delhi. The bottom picture is uh, our head organizer in Rome. We won a campaign where any of you, many of you live in student housing, but in Rome there's a gray market where landlords were essentially giving you the wink and nod They'll give you cheaper rent if you look the other way about the fact that they're not registering the property by law. A new law passed three years ago meant that if a tenant turned in that landlord to the tax rolls, you got a 85-90% reduction of your rent. So if you were paying 1,000 euros, you only paid 100, 150 euros for the term of an Italian lease. How, how long is a lease up here in uh, New Paltz? A year. a year. That's pretty standard, most places in the U.S. In Italy, a standard lease is four years and a four-year option to renew. So essentially, if you got that landlord on for eight years, your rent would be 100, 150 euros. Pretty big win for people down there. That's the first meeting of our first local group that we organized in Bristol, England here recently. The ACORN model, whether it was in the U.S. when we started or in the rest of the world, focuses on low and moderate income families. There's already enough organizations for the rich. Um, we don't do that. It's membership and mass base it means it's support. It's like a union in the community, if you see it that way. People pay dues. And just to make sure we're very clear, if I'm in India, people are paying 50 rupees a month. They may only be making 100, 150 rupees a day, so that dues is not unreasonable. It's all factored as if it were about $10, $12 a month U.S. So it's three soles in Peru, it's 50 rupees in India, and so forth and so on. It's 10 pesos in Mexico. We, tactically, we do direct actions. We don't just... Uh, do Facebook petitions, we don't just do petitions, we don't send letters, people actually mobilize, they give people an opportunity, they'll do sit-ins, they'll do demonstrations, they'll do uh, whatever they need to do. We're multi-issued, it's not just tenant issues, it's also living wages, it's also uh, rip-offs by local businesses, it's whatever issue our people democratically raise their hands to the members and say they want to get involved in. We're also different than a lot of organizations in we were in the U.S. is that we were just a straight nonprofit. There was no rule that said if we were fighting a mayor that when it came to election time we had to say, oh, we're, we're nonprofit, we can't be involved. If we were trying to push that mayor to do something, we could push him right to the election. So we had no sort of uh, tax, special tax status that said we could not do anything the members voted to do. We operated then and we operate nationally. Every local group, every country is autonomous. They can make their own policies within these rules. 
but when it has to do with a bigger issue internationally or in the U.S., nationally or Canada, it's coordinated. That's what we call coordinated autonomy. With me? So in the U.S., we started in 1970, Little Rock, Arkansas. That's what you were just talking about. That's uh, what our office looked like then, and for years and years, we started squatting down there. By 1980, we'd grown in that first 10 years to being in 20 states. Isn't that a beautiful graphic? We, if we get somebody to actually get from elementary school to high school, we're going to improve that one of these days soon. Uh, here's some pictures. There's uh, ex-secretary of housing, urban and development, uh, Henry Cisneros, with a bunch of members. There's an action about redlining, in other words, not being willing to loan people for repairs or purchasing homes if you lived in a neighborhood that was more African-American or more Latino or anything like that. The family of organizations, eventually by 2008, when I left in June of that year, there were 600 community organizations that were part of ACORN in the U.S., organized in 38 states. We didn't organize in Upper New England or in the Great Plains because there just weren't enough people to support a dues-based organization. A lot of other things, labor unions we talked about, organized people around Walmart expansion. We had uh, three radio stations that we put together. We still are running one in Little Rock, 100,000 watts, and one in Dallas for 60,000 watts. These are community non-commercial stations because, frankly, our members needed a voice. Simple as that. Housing Corporation ended up getting 7 million people houses through ACORN negotiated bank agreements. Service centers we built in many of our offices. We did taxes for people, 50,000 the last year I was there, 2008, say 20 million, living wage campaigns. And if you wonder what an, a community organization, a lot of people sort of think small is beautiful, but in community organizing, if you're going to build power, which is part of what the point is of organizing people around their issues to try to resolve longstanding grievances, you really need to be bigger, not smaller. And so it's not just loose dogs and drainage and stop signs, although those things are very important. But it also means, and this is one of the things I like to focus on, things like we saw in the election yesterday. In 2006, eight years ago, just in four ballot propositions around the minimum wage, we delivered $3 billion to 1.3 billion people getting a raise. And that's by getting an initiative on the ballot, running the campaign, and then making sure you won. This gives you a sense of what the votes are. So do you get a certain amount of power if organizationally you can put together measures that deliver 2 million votes in Ohio, 725 in Colorado, 1.5 million in Missouri? This is what we're going to talk about in terms of building organizations of scale. There's housing predatory lending, beat the tax people. Here's an outside study of just what we want in a nine-year period around these issues, $11 billion. Voter registration, and here's where we start coming to the more difficult part of the story. In 2008 alone, when President Obama was first elected, we registered in that cycle 1.5 million people. You know, there are a lot of people that didn't like that. And that's uh, what we're going to talk about. So in the 2008 election, there became huge, we ran a nonpartisan voter registration effort. And by that, we registered people regardless. If they weren't registered, we would help them get registered. Now, we did register low and moderate income families. We did register inordinately African American, Latino, and other families. So we're not naive, probably a lot of those people were not Republicans, but that wasn't our issue. Our issue was, in a democracy, putatively a democracy, you should be able to vote, and you, there's a responsibility to give people access to the vote. The Republicans and, and presidential candidate McCain charged Acorn with voter fraud. In the last debate, if anybody watched those debates, he said this was the biggest scandal ever in the history of elections, was ACORN's voter registration effort. 
I'd left the organization in June 2008 of that year after 38 years as both the founder and chief organizer, so I can't tell you how painful it is to watch all that. But it set in motion a series of partisan attacks against the organization. Even after President Obama was elected and the voter registration thing tied down, then there was more and more Republican. There was a James O'Keefe, a video scammer, did these videos showing up in various offices, editing and splicing the tape uh, together. So uh, it looked like Acorn was giving people advice about how to illegally get houses. Then it was coordinated with a censure motion uh, in Congress saying that now Acorn was not federally funded, but they wanted to bar any federal funds. So even though you have this membership organization not federally funded, you could say, well, how did that hurt the organization? Well, because even the banks where we had agreements, because they were all being bailed out in the financial crises, who owed us, in some cases, billions of dollars on those agreements for what they were supposed to provide, their lawyers were saying, well, we can give you the millions of dollars we contractually owe you, but then we can't get the billions of dollars we're getting from the bailout. So there was basically a cycle in 2010. The organization sort of gave up the ghost and in the United States went bankrupt. And that's, you know, where we start having that implosion that brings the question that we're talking about today to the front, which is, is grassroots community organi organizing dead or dying? And what can we do about that? Because once a national community organization of the size of ACORN, with a half million members that was able to operate both locally in those neighborhoods as well as city by city in the US, is forced out of business essentially because it couldn't handle the political and financial pressure of all these partisan attacks, what fills that void? And this is both a good news, bad news story. So there are many interesting grassroots community organizing projects around the country still. Up the road from here in Buffalo, there's a group called PUSH that's done some very interesting work around particularly neighborhoods where there's huge housing abandonment. Um, the Ohio Community Collaborative, not far from here, is a very interesting organizing model. There are networks of faith and church-based organizations, the Gamaliel Foundation, PICO, the Industrial Areas Foundation has a number of groups that was created in the wake of the uh, uh, following example of Saul Linsky, who many people see as the father of community organizing. There's also a lot of very interesting work done with worker centers and uh, immigrant rights organizations. Casa de Maryland is one of the largest ones in Illinois. The Illinois Refugee Rights uh, Council is, is uh, very large and powerful. There are uh, after ACORN went out of business formally, a number of its state organizations, not the 38 I just showed you a picture of, but about eight or nine were able to survive by changing their names. There's New York Communities for Change here. There's uh, Action United in Pennsylvania. There's ACE in California, a community voice in Louisiana, a, uh, Arkansas Community Organizations in Arkansas. These are all organizations that in local areas are doing important work, and it's worth you finding out what and where they're, they're operating. We also had, in the, in the void after ACORN left, we had the Occupy movement, which was a major organizing phenomena that swept not only this country, but many other cities around the world. The problem is that in some ways, the, for, for the accomplishment of Occupy, which tended to be to focus on the level of inequality, both globally and in the United States, the tactic in some ways swallowed the strategy. The notion of the encampments weren't sustainable as winter kept coming, and for one reason or another, the um, that movement, uh, as, it, as it grew, as exciting as it was, was just not something that was able to affect permanent or long-term change. Uh, so there's still important residues of it, but unfortunately, getting back to this question of is community organizing alive or dead, you have a very fragile set of institutions now 
and a gap and a void with Acorn's implosion that hasn't been filled. The part of what is, is challenging and troubling about this, particularly for any of you who might think about doing this work in the future and for all of us like myself who do the work, is it's chilling. Some of what has happened over the last four or five years, particularly ACORN, has stopped people from being able to do work. For example, when I talked about, and this was seen in the election yesterday and two years ago, when I talked about the 1.5 million people that ACORN registered nationally, nobody's filled that void because you can't run a perfect voter registration effort. Here's the little understood part that the Republicans sort of mask here, and, and the Democrats too, because they don't understand it. If you're registering voters, you don't have a choice but to turn in every signed registration form to whoever that local governmental authority is. You don't get to decide because you're registering, oh, this one looks like it's not his correct name or signature, I'm just not going to turn that in. I'll just throw that in the trunk of the car. So everybody knew when Mickey Mouse signed a registration form because some wise ass thought that was hilarious putting Mickey Mouse. Everybody knows Mickey Mouse has to register and vote in Orlando. And so a few registers Mickey Mouse in St. Louis you knew that wasn't really Mickey's vote. But you still had to turn it in. So we often had to turn in two stacks. One big stack of people who were registered and we knew were good. And another smaller stack that was obviously bogus. It'd be the whole Dallas Cowboys team. Not in Dallas but in Phoenix, or in Vegas, or somewhere like that. Or there'd be odd, random movie stars, uh, like Mickey and the gang. So the Republicans, in this argument about voter registration fraud, were arguing, hey, look, Acorn's registering Mickey Mouse in half a dozen places around the country. Well, as I've already said, we only would possibly accept that registration in Orlando. So part of what was chilling is that if Acorn couldn't defend itself from that attack, that meant most other community organizations knew you couldn't run a perfect system because you had to turn stuff in. You couldn't all of a sudden. We were spending extra money before I left in 2008 with whole teams to verify every registration to make sure it was really that person, was that address, et cetera, et cetera, to try to get as close to 99.9% .9 as we could. But you can't run a perfect program. So what that's meant is you don't have community organizations running anything but very small neighborhood programs with their heads down, duck and cover style. That doesn't do the job when we're talking about the millions of people, particularly now under voter suppression efforts, that are having more and more trouble getting registered and staying registered. Secondly, you also have the problem that nobody really, because of the political attack, most organizations and all of the former ACORN organizations that sort of rebranded or went to ground or whatever you call that, reconstituted as 501c3s or c4s. Now, what does that mean to you? Nothing. Nothing. You don't file taxes for the most part. Um, but a 501c3 status means you're tax exempt and you don't have to file taxes. If you remember back to when I first started, I said ACORN was not a 501c3, was not a 501c4. If we'd ever made money, you know what we would have done? Pay taxes. Now, at least the 38 years I ran, I can guarantee you we were never going to make money. That's probably a, a problem of another kind. But the point is, they then took themselves out of the political arena to try to survive. And that's what happened to most community organizations. So rather than this 35 almost 40 years of ACORN were led the way to get more and more willing to engage and lower income people be active as political participants, you have people recoiling from that community organizations everywhere. That's, that's not a good thing. You have a Congress that's it's a mishmash. Uh, community organizations, no matter how large an ACORN might have been, it's very difficult to defend yourself against an entire political establishment like the U.S. Congress. And I think we're about to all find out over the next two years. So now we have a situation where, for some people, having even worked with ACORN is like a scarlet letter. For other people, it's like a red badge of courage. So, um, and this notion of it being chilling to do this work, I think, is something that uh, we have to battle. 
I'll give you a couple examples. One is, I just heard this two weeks ago, a guy who worked for me for 30 years in Arkansas as our political director said, oh, well, you know, they're still all hung up about ACORN. He wasn't allowed to be on a conference call that some group was having about voter registration because they Googled him and knew he worked with ACORN. Yet, three days ago, his picture was in the New York Times for having run the minimum wage campaign in Arkansas that just raised the minimum wage in that state by 65% vote to 850 an hour by 2017. Local 100, our union, and the former uh, Louisiana ACORN were navigators, signed up tens of thousands of people on the health care program, the Affordable Care Act, in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. Weren't renewed for a second year because the only group that was ever mentioned in House investigations was the fact that they were concerned that anything that had ever been part of the ACORN family of organizations might be signing people up for affordable care. Well, who better to sign up people, lower income people, frankly, for affordable care in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas than people who have that experience? And finally, you have people like James O'Keefe still out there running wild on the right. Now, do people know who this guy is? Okay, one guy, so I'll talk just to you. Anybody else? Just two or three of you? So he has this thing called Veritas. He thinks he's a citizen journalist. He shows up. He's tried to scam a number of people. So this is his MO. This is his business model. You try to catch people in these gotcha moments. So he got arrested in the federal building in New Orleans trying to prove that Mary Landrieu, the senator from Louisiana, was not her people were not answering the phone for people about Affordable Care Act. So he was going to go in and tamper with the phone system in a federal building. Well, he was on probation for that for a year or two. He had to pay fifty thousand. Uh, well, Hannah Giles, his partner, had to pay fifty thousand. He had to pay a hundred thousand for causing someone to be fired from his mis-editing in in National City outside of San Diego. So we knew. I mean, it never stops. When we were doing the healthcare registration, we just assumed O'Keefe. Okay, and his type would be coming in soon. In fact, that's part of what every community organi organization needs to assume if they deal with people that you'll have right-wing folks doing this sort of, you know, I spy, you know, kind of thing. And sure enough, signing up people for affordable care, we had a guy come in twice asking us, well, couldn't he claim he had a different income? Couldn't he kind of wink and nod and tell us a different income? He comes in a second time and Two of our staff, both uh, middle-aged African-American women, notice he's got a red light sort of blinking in his pocket. And they say, you know, what's that, what's that in your pocket there? Oh, that's just my cell phone. Cell phone, no problem, cell phone. Now, come on, show me what's in your pocket. Because we train people pretty aggressively to look out for this. All of a sudden, they say, it's a camera. He's, got it. he's trying to record them, see if he can O'Keefe trick them. So then, if you can picture this in your mind, he turns around and starts running out of the, our building in Dallas, our office in Dallas, and these two middle-aged, and it would be a long time since any of these sisters had run 50 years, they chased him out there into the parking lot, and he jumps in a car, and they tell, tell the story of this day. But the point is, it's changed the character of community organizations, because it's no longer doing just what we know how to do, it's also dealing with the fact that they're constantly under attack, that if you can prove that you can go after something as big as ACORN, there is no end to where it stops. And what, what this has meant, and what I fear, and that's part of what we're talking about, obviously, that's why I got invited to share my fears with you, and we'll deal with your questions soon, which I'll enjoy more, but it's changed the nature of organizing from being transformational to transactional. You're taking notes, make sure you got this one down. Because this is what we're seeing in more and more work for social change, is that the problem of driving resources, which is key to organizing, is changing the mission of why you need these resources. 
Naomi Klein, who's the Toronto-based author and researcher, just, did, just finished and is going around with a book called This Changes Everything. It looks at the environmental movement. So I'm going to talk about that for a second and sneak you back into community organizing. So anybody read this book yet? You've heard about it? You know who she is? Okay, one brother here. So you're going through the first three or four chapters. You're not sure you're going to make it through. She's, you know, she's here, she's there, she's visiting here, she's uh, jet setting around. Oh my God! No, Naomi, get to the point. Boom! She gets to the point. Starts looking at these environmental organizations. Nature Conservancy, three billion dollars worth of assets. Turns out they were given some land by Mobile Oil Company, Mobile Conoco, down near Galveston. Close to my country, I live in New Orleans. I go to our Houston office all the time, so I know exactly what they're talking about. To protect some birds, some plovers or something. And 15 years ago they were given it, and they're actually, they have oil wells on that property that they're allowed to be re-drilled closer to the breeding area that they're using as a revenue source for the Nature Conservancy. They claimed several times over the last 15 years, and she documents in that book, no, no, we stopped doing that. No, our bad, our bad. You know, we lease conditions, whatever. And then she looks at Environmental Defense Fund and the fact that Sierra Club took money from Chesapeake. And it turns out that a number, almost all of the very largest National Resource Defense Councils and other, almost all the largest of the environmental organizations were so deeply in bed with the oil and gas industry that to see their leadership against climate change had been lost in this notion of transactionalism. You can't beat them, join them, they have the resources or whatever. And Naomi actually, her contribution is huge to look so seriously at that because this is exactly what I fear is happening in community organizing. There was an article by the lead organizer with Virginia Organizing Social Policy, which is a journal we help edit, that was entitled Leadership is Not a Deliverable. Well, what they're talking about is they could no longer get funded to do the core work of community organizing, organize people for change, develop leadership, develop democratic capacity, because they could only raise money if they were willing to get so many people out for a demonstration or so many petition signatures for some, for some uh, other campaign. And there's a whole school of organizing now that's presenting itself as what's called consensus organizing. And they're very clear that that's in, in counterpoint to conflict organizing. And the example of conflict organizing is something like that ACORN thing, where you're actually, members are demonstrating, people are making demands. The consensual organizing is you go cozy up to the target and see how you do. Maybe you can win more that way. It's a sort of, you can't beat them, so let's join them. Um, my point in a nutshell is, as we used to say at ACORN all the time, is that transi transactional organization is not a transition to transformative organization. It's a subversion of it. And unless we're willing to do what I think is actually the good work, the hard work, of building autonomous community organizations, building their own base, and making them sustainable, so if they have the resources, dues, or if you can figure out something better, God love you, let me copy from you. Some way that they can finance themselves without this transactional basis, we're not going to be able to develop the capacity for change. And part of the problem is with funders. Whether it's the environmental folks making the deals with the oil and gas and energy companies, or community organizations with foundations and funders, the problem comes in a number of ways. One, funders no longer respect you at that level. If they can get you to do the work based on sort of uh, you deliver this number of people at so many actions in Kentucky and we'll give you, t well, they've already changed the relationship and the, there's, there's not going to be any respect there. Secondly, there's not going to be any autonomy. Um, and the, the, the other problem is that the foundations, and this is also true for unions and whatever, they also don't know how to win the campaigns. And that's what I think is the worst. And I'll give you an example of that. Not that you want one, but... So, when I first left ACORN for a while, this was 2008, I was a consultant to the national immigration reform efforts. And 
they came to a consensus that if they were going to have a chance at winning immigration reform, and I think they were probably right, right although six years ago, they had to somehow force the issue of immigration reform to one of the top five or six issues for the president to deal with in the first hundred days when he had the mandate. Well, to do this, they've been lobbying, they've been doing the Beltway stuff, they wanted to do a major demonstration, 15, 20,000 people on Inauguration Day when President Obama was inaugurated to force themselves right to the center of the debate. So they had, I was a consultant, so I was doing whatever they wanted, so I know how to do that stuff. They had me helping put together this action of 20,000. All of a sudden, a week or two before it happens, the whole thing gets turned down because the funders for the immigration reform campaign, committed $20 million, decided then, no, we want to give Obama the first six months to sort of find his sea legs. Well, if there's one thing you knew then, even then, about President Obama, he's a former community organizer, if you pushed him, you won. But if you didn't push him, you got nothing. So essentially, they limited us. We had a couple thousand people out. The Casa de Maryland still wanted to do it, so they did a little symbolic theme. But that lost opportunity is part of the reason we're sitting here with only the people who have been militant and aggressive, the dreamers, over the last six years have really won something in immigration reform and have been able to keep the heat on the president and may even, with this terrible legislative situation, be able to win something. The funders... Let's hope they know something about how to make a decision to fund somebody, but that doesn't mean they're qualified to build an organizing campaign or to win a major social or political issue. There's nothing in their background or anything else that says they know how to do that. So here's the problem we come down to. You got a heartbeat, you got a lot of good community organizations still out there and active, but there are no shortcuts. And we've got challenges. So You can't win without a base. Building a base, and we found this in ACORN. We can look at the end when we had 500,000 members, but that's 38 years after we started. We didn't always have that. When I talked about ACORN International, that's 12 years. We have 110,000 members. Well, that seems like a lot, but that's spread over a lot of countries around the world. That's not that big. That's actually pretty small everywhere. It's not enough to make large-scale social change. So, the work is hard, you need to do that work. Too many times now we're being deceived about whether or not there's some shortcuts. And I'll give you a couple of examples that are more global, perhaps, than local. My daughter calls, you know, some of these Facebook things slacktivists, if you've ever heard that. The notion that you can sort of do a petition, like something, not like something, and somebody's going to move on that. And they talked for a while about, you know, Iran a couple of years ago, if you read the paper at all, had a Twitter revolution, or so Twitter said. Then you find out that in Iran with 78 million people, how many people do you think were on Twitter? Yes, anybody? Million? Twelve million? Come on, somebody guess. How hard is this? Five million. Five million. That'd be, you know, less than 10%, but it'd be somebody. Anybody else guess? 20,000. 20,000. Well, that's 30,000. Twitter finally admitted there were 30,000 people on, but they were the right 30,000, they said. So, step back from this. Just as an organizer, I know, as just somebody listening, you know, there's no way there was anything called a Twitter revolution. You look at Egypt. Supposedly this is a Facebook revolution. Well, Facebook was important. It was an important communication tool, as Twitter was. And there was some Google guy that got caught in Tahrir Square, whatever. There was a petition. A lot of people signed it. But in truth, if you look more carefully at it, I mean, there was even an article on the front page of the New York Times, David Kirkpatrick, who's one of their Egyptian reporters, talked about how those demonstrations were really put together in Tahrir Square. If you listen to me, you're not going to be surprised at this. So activists for years. People trying to organize felt that the way to get change against Mubarak was to go out to the largely middle-income areas and talk to people about corruption. And mainly the people who would show up would be police. And it wasn't dangerous, and 
Nobody cared, and they kept hitting their head against the wall, and nothing happened. And then, just like good community organizers, they started putting out leaflets in the slums around Trahir Square about the fact that people could not get jobs, and the housing was uninhabitable, too expensive, and, un and unaffordable. And to their shock, all of a sudden, when they started putting out that kind of message and say, follow us into the square, thousands of people left and followed them into the square. That's not a Facebook thing. That's just straight shoe leather on the street organizing. And then when we took a delegation of 25 organizers, labor and community organizers, the organizers forum to Egypt, we found out something else. That for the first time, what gained some of the traction was independent unions had gone on strike and Mubarak could not get them to go back to work. So they basically had people on the street, plus they had the economy by the throat. Now all those things turned out to make a lot of difference because they had a base that was moving. Did they have a revolution? Well, unfortunately now we know there was no deep organization, so the revolution has not been able to survive. My point, though, is that Facebook, Internet, I think the Internet's, I think it's here to stay. Seems like, a big, seems like a good thing. These things are great communication tools. We couldn't organize Acorn International without email and Skype because we could never afford to communicate with this far-flung number of organizers any other way. So we Skype, we email, you know, get together wherever we can. Now you can Google Hangout if Google didn't send everything to the NSA. And, you know, you have lots of other opportunities. These are great communication tools. These are not organizing tools. There's still no substitute for doing the hard work in places to build real organization. And uh, we keep up with it. But the proof in, in the pudding is that people are looking to organize. You can see that in Egypt. You can see that in Iran. I'll all of a sudden on my blog, which is www.cheaporganizer.org, and we were going through it before, that all of a sudden, three or four months ago, four times, it would be a big spike, you know, on analytics if you read. Google Analytics on stuff. People know what I'm talking about? Okay, well, I'm not working with you. Um, so it'd be a big spike. And you look in the 10 cities, if you know how to do that, countries and cities, you look at the 10 cities. And all of a sudden, in the top 10 cities would be, oh yeah, there'd be New York and DC and New Orleans and Toronto and you know, places, London, where we organize, but all of a sudden, Tehran would be right there in number five. And then number eight would be a city I didn't know about and have to go to Wikipedia and find out it's the second largest city in Iran. So all of a sudden, when something loosened up in Iran, you have these people jumping on anywhere they can come, which is how they probably stumbled onto my blog, looking for any information they can find about how you organize, how you make change, how you do something. So it's real. People want organizations. People are desperate to find organizers and others that can help them get together to try to make change. But unfortunately for all of its soaring moments, a lot of organizing is day in, day out, grind, grinding work. It's hitting doors, it's getting people back on the phone, it's making sure all the emails got out, it's making sure the, the you know, door got opened in the meeting place. Years ago, I had a very brief collegiate career, you know, I was about your age, so I didn't really need to go to school. I was 20, 19, and luckily at that time, much like many of you, I, I knew everything. You know, it's only more recently that I found out how little I knew, but I knew everything, and so I kept dropping out of school. I dropped out of college the first time to organize against the Vietnam War. Um, the second time I dropped out, Never went back. I was organizing welfare recipients in Springfield. But I heard back at the school up the road, it was only a couple hours away, that Saul Olinsky, the great community organizer, or as I said earlier, the father of community organizing, was speaking at my old college. Well, it was a fall night about like now, drive up there, go listen to Saul. 
And, you know, he told jokes and stories. He was a wonderful, who knows how good an organizer he was, but he was a great ambassador for community organizing. He'd go to colleges and give lectures at big halls filled up everywhere. And there was, you know, must have been three or 400 people there at the school I went to. They were loving every bit of it. And his message would always be, all of you can organize. We need all of you to organize. All of you can be organizers. And he'd have a line going all the way at the end when he finished talking. He'd have a line going all the way back up to the top of the auditorium. People talking about how they could be organizers. Well, that was a harder part. This was 19, uh, 1968, 69. And so the women who had asked him, well, what can I do to be a community organizer? He'd say, because I, I was sort of standing there listening, come back when you're 40 after you've had children. And then we'll talk. We'll see if we can find a place for you. The man, he'd say, maybe. Well, I'm going to tell you the truth. He was a man of his time. I'm a man of these times. Not everybody can be an organizer. But everyone can help organize. Everyone can support movements growing. Everybody has a, pro a place and a role to play in making change. There is no shortcut. And that's what I've tried to say over the last, you know, 40 minutes or so. There isn't a shortcut. There's not enough organizers. There's not enough organizations. There are not enough people putting their shoulders to the wheel. So we have all these millions and millions of people in this country, U.S. Certainly we're seeing it in Canada. We're seeing it literally all over the world. We don't have the time and resources at Acorn International, they didn't respond to a part of the request we get for help in organizing. Yet, you have this opportunity. Let me tell you this. You're getting out of school. There's no jobs out there that you want to do. Maybe you're lucky. Maybe you can find something. But what people need is something that defines their lives. What I was lucky to find, what I hope you're lucky to find, is something that's bigger than any of us can be. That gives us a role in something that, in fact, still changes the world. You may not have thought about it, but I'd encourage you to think about being organizers or helping in some way to build organizations. Because there are a million roles, there are a million people that are needed. The future is just out there waiting for you. It's an opportunity bigger. I promised my sister when she left, I was over. So thank you. You take it from here to there. We have time for some questions? Okay. So you weren't good at guessing. Thanks to everybody who guessed uh, about Twitter. But uh, questions are it's a wider, a wider waterfront. Yes, sir. How would you say the organizing of the right, with the Tea Party and the NRA, and even last night's mobilization? How would that be different than the type of organizing you're talking about? Well, I mean, the Tea Party doesn't build a base. I mean, they, they don't build organizations. So I think as if you compare them to a movement, I think there are many elements that are very similar to the, in the Tea Party movement a couple of years ago to what you see in other kinds of movements on the left or right or wherever. But they seem to have no interest in building organizational capacity that can deeply involve build local party organizations and stuff like that. So they have polarized around certain issues very effectively, particularly in some parts of the country. Uh, but they don't seem to have, you know, three or four years ago when I first wrote these books, I could count on, and Jesse asked me this, will there be demonstrations? Well, it used to be, no matter where I went, I'd get some Tea Party people. I, you know, they don't, they're just not out there anymore uh, at that level. So they're more of a, a boogeyman than they are a force. Now, um, when you talk about party organizations, I mean, obviously we spent a lot of time trying to build alternatives to the existing party system, the Working Families Party here in New York and Connecticut, Pennsylvania and elsewhere. We were founders of that party. Danny Cantor, who's executive director, worked on Parade Corn in our union for, you know, 10, 15 years. So we're very close to that effort. Um, those things are hard to do. There are sustained efforts over time that take lots of people and resources, and we haven't seen that in a Tea Party. 
I think here, here's the, most, the best news I have about what happened yesterday. There's another election coming. You know, there were some signs yesterday, there were what, four or five minimum wage statewide issues that passed. Uh, there was, you know, a number of local progressive fights that were very important. If you ever follow something that's in the anti-corporate world, the fight between in Richmond, California on the Bay and Chevron, they elected a mayor and re-elected uh, three, three city council people with the Richmond Progressive Association, a sort of an alternative community-based local organization there. So at the local level where people are doing the work, there's still a lot of excitement. Even yesterday, as everything at the top looked like it was going to, going to spit, there was still a lot of gold underneath that. In two years, if all we cared about was which way the Senate went, um, the Republicans have 24, 25 incumbents up then. Democrats only have 10. And the Republicans that are up are all in states that were so blue that Obama carried them last on his last election victory in, in, 20, in 2012. So it's likely that we've got a hellacious two years. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Senate didn't move back to the Democrat. But i got to ask you, without an active base moving for change, does it matter? I mean, what we saw over the last couple of years is even giving the president credit for all the best intentions, there wasn't enough to get it to happen to satisfy many of us. And uh, I think the Republicans are going to have that same problem. There's no, they're not going to all of a sudden win everything they propose. Um, the key thing I've found, and uh, you know, this is every day you have to go to work. Every day you have to join the fight. What we get from an organization is the ability to keep fighting. And as long as we keep fighting, we turn out to have a chance of winning. And I think as uh, uh, Eugene Debs, the great uh, you know, politician and labor organizer used to say, victory then is as, is as inevitable as the rising of the sun. Next question, yes sir. Um, I, I think I'm as sympathetic as I can be to what the uh, Working Families Party uh, basically re represents, and yet uh, could you address the possible parallels between your references to environmental organizations that have been heavily influenced by um, uh, right-wing corporate pressures and the Working Families Party, given the fact that it endorsed Andy Cuomo for governor and given his whole track record as being largely antagonistic to uh, uh, basic work, working class interests and his shutting down of the Moreland Commission when it was getting a little close to his funding sources on Park Avenue and Wall Street. So, and I, I know this is something that uh, understandably would, would be uh, sensitively uh, felt by you because you've put a lot of very fine effort into building that party, but. Uh, is there some degree to which we need to revisit the way uh, community organizing uh, is done to ensure that it doesn't wind up legitimizing someone uh, who, who represents really backward tendencies in the uh, capitalist system? So I'm going to say something, and I'm going to answer your question. So I'm going to defend the Working Families Party. At the same time, you know, I haven't been in New York in two or three years, frankly. So this is not where I spend time. I spend time working in those 17, 18, 19 countries. And I'm very proud of the role we had in helping build the Working Families Party, very supportive. But every bit of who shot John, I'm not an authority on. But you know, I do read the paper. And here's what I know about the party. that. People actually vote on positions in that party, including whether or not to endorse Zephyr Teachout, who was a comrade and friend of mine. I worked with her for years when I was still with ACORN, or Governor Cuomo. And 
I read probably the same paper you did. If there had been more people in the room going the other way, I'm not sure what would have happened to Cuomo. And certainly, it came down the end to it looked like to me a huge amount of pressure that the mayor put on the party to try to come to a concession. It seems pretty clear that Cuomo double-crossed them too, doesn't it? So I would bet there is, uh, I actually reached out on email uh, to, to Danny Cantor over the last day or two. I bet there's a, a huge amount of internal discussion now about exactly that question. I don't think, when I talk about transactional relationships, I'm really talking about people and organizations that are in a position where they can be bought. I don't think that's the situation for the Working Families Party. The biggest acts against this neck, as you know, and some of you who are not from New York have probably no clue what we're talking about, is they have to get a certain number of votes to protect their ballot line. For the last number of years, they've been moving up in position in the ballot line, and clearly the way Cuomo tried to double-cross them was inventing this other party, I don't even know the name, women something, it's see if they can get enough votes, and then if you kept the uh, Working Families Party, and I think they made that number, but you know clearly they were in uh, uh, a very difficult position in which, uh, you know, what I learned watching Acorn put out of business after I left is to make sure we were always self-sufficient. I'm sure what they've learned now watching what Cuomo did to them has a lot to do with what future positions you'll see in the party. 